Within the Gulf, over 90% of its oil exports flow to another single point, Karg Island. An American effort to remove Iran from play could be completed in a single afternoon, and since Karg does not have a bridge or tunnel connecting it to the mainland, re-entering energy markets would take years. But these vulnerabilities are only vulnerabilities against the maritime superpower. For anyone else in Iran's broader neighborhood, Iran's position is a nightmare. While mountain states are typically neither rich nor naval, they're also damnably difficult to invade. Each mountain ridge is a new defensive bulwark that has to be ground through. But such mountains do little to inhibit the offensive capabilities of the locals. A large mountain state like Iran can in one critical way act like a naval power. It can bide its time, secure in its mountain fastness, until it makes sense to boil out. In past spurts of activity, Persia has conquered lands from Egypt to Greece to Tajikistan to India. There are four regional power centers that would likely be the targets of Iranian expansionism, one of which has been somewhat pacified already. The pacified target is directly to the west, ancient Mesopotamia, better known in contemporary times as Iraq. Iraq in any age is a riparian state that draws its strength from its ability to use the Tigris and Euphrates to generate massive, sustained agricultural surpluses, and thus generate population booms as necessary. It has historically used those booms to extend its control not just up and down the river valleys, but south into Arabia, west into what is now Syria, and east into the Persian highlands. It has always been the geography that has generated the most difficulties and hardships for the Persians, and as such is typically the first territory that Persia absorbs in its own expansionary phases. At the time of this writing, the United States' war with Iraq is over, and Iran has taken advantage of the American withdrawal to install many of its allies into the Iraqi government, up to and including the Prime Minister. While it would be overly simplistic to say that Iran already controls Iraq, it is certainly more of a springboard for Iranian future ambitions than a sandbag. To the southwest lies Saudi Arabia, the largest of the Gulf oil states and the world's largest exporter of crude oil. Iran's goal is nothing less than the subordination of Saudi Arabia, and the two countries' religious differences – Saudi Arabia is the keeper of Sunni Islam, while Iran is the protector of Shia Islam – only adds a layer of religious feuding to a contest that is already economic, political, and strategic. Iran is clearly the superior power, with nearly triple the population and a military that is actually used to shooting people, while the Saudi military does not operate well outside of air conditioning. But an Iranian victory would not be clean, easy, or quick. Saudi power comes from its oil money and its possession of the holy sites of Islam, Combined, these two features allow them to recruit Islamic fighters to do battle for them when and where they wish to project power. With the more infamous locations being Afghanistan, Russia, the Northern Caucasus, Iraq, Libya, and Syria. They have nearly nudged Iraq back into civil war, and in the Syrian civil war these Saudi-backed militias now form the backbone of the revolutionary forces. Saudi initiatives in both theaters are merely the leading edge of Riyadh's efforts to bring battle to the Iranians. As it becomes more obvious that the American withdrawal from the region is not temporary, the gloves will come off, and the Saudis will work to unleash hell not just in Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, and other places in which the Iranians have interests, but in Iran itself. Of particular importance will be Iran's Arab minority, concentrated in the southwestern border province of Khuzestan. That just happens to be where most of Iran's oil production takes place. In addition to more conventional tools, like an invasion, count on the Iranians to return the favor. Saudi Arabia's Shia minority is concentrated in its own eastern oil-producing region. To the north is the Caucasus, an excellent buffer between Iran and the lands of the Russians. Well, excellent for the Russians anyway. While the Russians no longer count the Caucasus as an internal region as it was during the Soviet period, they still have several thousand troops each in Armenia and Georgia. While Azerbaijan realizes that its ongoing existence as an independent power requires it to collaborate with Moscow on a host of issues. Russian forces in Armenia are there by mutual agreement, mostly to serve as a military tripwire against Azerbaijan and Turkey. Russian forces in Georgia, in contrast, help two secessionist regions, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, maintain independence from Georgian control. 
Iran's problem is that 16% of its population is Azerbaijani. That places more Azerbaijanis in Iran than exist in the independent country of Azerbaijan. That makes the buffer not only directly adjacent to territories that house Russian troops, but introduces an irredentist threat hard up on Iran's northwestern border. The only way that Iran's northern flank can truly be secure would be if it occupied most of the Caucasus region itself. Unfortunately, the only way that Russia's southern flank can be secure would be for Russia to do the same. For both Iran and Russia, to say nothing of Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia, the Caucasus is a zero-sum game. While Russia is far from a pushover and attacking the Caucasus would be expensive and difficult, time is on the Iranian side. Iran has a young and rapidly growing population, while Armenia, Georgia, and Russia have three of the world's oldest and most rapidly contracting. Finally, to the northwest lies Turkey. Most of Turkey's economic and political interests lie in the Black Sea and Nubian basins, but that is in a world in which free trade thrives. Once the Americans stop guaranteeing global energy supplies, the Turks will have to secure their own. The closest energy lies in northern Iraq, an area populated by Kurds, whom the Turks have always feared will stir up problems among Turkey's own Kurdish citizens. The only way to guarantee both the unity of the Turkish state and secure access to oil is to either conquer northern Iraq outright, or to pack it so thoroughly with Turkish advisors that it would no longer be functionally independent. Either way, Iran will have an opinion on the issue. Iran also has a strong opinion on what unfolds in Syria. As long as the fighting there continues, the Turks must fret about developments along their entire southern periphery. With America's gradual withdrawal from the Persian Gulf, the strategic logjam that has existed for the past half century is breaking up. But it is not the victory that the Iranians had hoped for. The American departure means that Iran is being released to engage not one but four regional powers in a general melee. That melee is the unspoken goal of American foreign policy. To ensure that all of the world's other major powers are preoccupied with each other rather than thinking of putting to sea. No matter what Iran prioritizes, no matter what Iran does, no matter if Iran wins or loses, its very existence keeps four other powers firmly nailed to local developments. And all the United States has to do is nothing. And now, things get a bit complicated. Each of these countries, whether due to opportunity or desperation, will attempt to sculpt their neighborhood into something more to their liking. Their interactions will determine the specifics of the world of the future, but none of them will have a large-scale impact upon the top workings of the American government, much less how the Americans live their lives. In their splendid isolation, the Americans will have a very high bar for noticing what is unfolding elsewhere on the planet, and an even higher bar for jumping into the fray.